peace to you, my friends. Many of you know that I am a Chicago Cubs fan. Even though my family is from the south side of Chicago, everyone in my family is a Cubs fan. Minus one. Yes, it's true. Now, I love all my nieces and nephews. And as an uncle, I've tried to support them in whatever interests that they might have. So I've done all kinds of things with them, such as going to the Shed Aquarium to seeing penguins, to helping an aspiring chef cook a meal. A few years ago, though, I was saddened to learn that my one nephew had turned to the dark side and became a White Sox fan. As much as I want to support him in his interest and endeavors, indulging this particular passion is a line I'm just not willing to cross. The fact he no longer is a Cubs fan doesn't make me love him any less. I haven't cut off communication with him or looked to spend less time with him. Of course, I'll tease him about the errors of his way. But it's all in good fun. He'll always be my nephew. And I'll always be his uncle. And ultimately, I will always hold out hope that one day, he will see the light and wear the cubby blue once again. Today's gospel contains a peculiar parable about two sons. The father requests of each of them to go and work in the vineyard. The first son says no, but afterwards changed his mind and went. The second son said yes, but didn't go. And to this, Jesus asks the chief priests and the elders the question, which of the two sons did the father's will? And they reply, the first. To which Jesus says, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before the chief priests and elders. The implication of this parable is clear. In their response, the chief priests and elders implicated themselves as being more akin to the second son, who said yes, but ultimately did not do the will of the father. And whereas the tax collectors and prostitutes are more like the first son, who said no, but upon hearing the words of John the Baptist and the call to repentance, ultimately did do the father's will. Good parable. And any parent can identify with the difference between a child who says yes to something that is asked of them but doesn't comply, and the child who says no, but in the end does what is told. But is this parable's lesson limited to an understanding on obedience? Or is there something more going on here? On a whole other level, this parable is an illustration of God always holding out hope for the possibility of real repentance. Notice the father in the parable does not punish the son who said no, nor does he throw him out of the house for disobeying or disrespecting him. No, it clearly implies that the father hoped that the son would come around and do what he asked which eventually he does. In the kingdom of God, it is never too late for a sinner to repent. Even the most hardened hearts that say no can eventually turn to saying yes. This understanding is of supreme importance in the troubling times that we find ourselves in. It has become rather commonplace today to completely disregard those we perceive to be on the wrong side of history, those whose intentions we may question, those who have sinned. We want nothing to do with them, lest we compromise our own moral integrity. That's kind of what is going on, and we actually have a name for that. We call that cancel culture, and parties on every side 
are guilty of this. Sadly, this approach has become the rationale for violence to be inflicted on others because we perceive them to be evil, sinful or wrong, unworthy of our respect, and even inhuman. Worse still, some may even think that they are doing the work of God when doing this, when rejecting others, when canceling them, when inflicting violence and hatred upon them. And there simply is no truth to this. God's ways do not involve violence to others. God who is love does not respond to evil or sin with hatred and violence, but rather responds with love. As Jesus did with Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane when he told him to put away his sword, so too are we being asked to put aside our angers, our desires to hurt and to inflict punishment. Why? Because God always holds out hope that the sinner will repent. So there is no cancel culture in the kingdom of God. There is no justification for violence in the kingdom, regardless of how serious the sin might be. As disciples, we too are being asked to have the same hope that God does, to withhold judgment, to withhold punishment, to withhold the impulse to cancel someone, and to instead pray for the conversion of hearts, including our own. My friends, the challenge of this parable is one that each and every one needs to take to heart and really struggle with having the same patience, mercy, and gentleness as displayed by the father towards both his sons. Because in the end, both of the sons wronged the father, one at the beginning and the other at the end. But with both, the father showed mercy. This parable's lesson is of supreme importance to us these days. Over the next month, we as Americans will be going to the polls or mailing in our ballots for the next president. And in a couple of months, we will gather around the Thanksgiving Day dinner table with family and friends who may have wronged us or who may hold to different viewpoints than we do or live lives that we either don't understand, agree with, or have yet to accept. In any and all of these situations, it's good for us to note that hatred and anger and violence will only further calcify human hearts, especially our own. And only love will be able to bring about a conversion of hearts. Only love can bring everyone around to righteousness, truth, and loyalty to God and the Chicago Cubs.